for half a century, WJPZ Syracuse has been the greatest media classroom on the planet. We've trained students from the 1970s to the 2020s on how to run a professional radio station. But the lessons learned and relationships formed go far beyond studios and transmitters. Taking a look back through the eyes of those who experienced it. This is WJPZ at 50. Welcome to WJPZ at 50. I am John Jagay. I am really excited about this episode. We have four Hall of Famers on the same episode all together. This is the group that is largely responsible for putting the radio station on FM in the mid 80s. And we're going to dive right in. We'll introduce all four people and we're going to go. Uh, I'll go in the order that you popped up on my screen. So we'll start with you, Dr. Phil. Uh, Phil Locasio, also known as Dr. Phil to everybody when I was on the air, uh, became program director and then a general manager. Been in radio all my life. And now I work in sales for Odyssey, New York. And speaking of Odyssey, back over to my hometown of Boston and Eric Fitch. Eric Fitch, I was uh, at Syracuse from 1885 and was the chief engineer. And actually, I have to blame Phil for dragging me into the radio station. He was on my floor That's... freshman year, and he uh, dragged me down. I had really no interest in radio. And he's like, oh, no, yeah, just come down. Just got to fix a couple of things. And, and next thing you know, I'm on top of the Prudential Tower fixing uh, three 50,000-watt radio stations what, 42 years later. And you still have no interest in radio. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> From the top of the Mount Olympus to the top of the proof. Very well done, Eric. And to my state where I started my career in, and that is Vermont, Mr. Bob Flint. Bob Flint. I serve a bunch of roles at JPZ, including as general manager and the first chairman of the board and was in radio for many years, but now uh, work in economic development in Springfield, Vermont, my hometown. And over to you, Chris. Chris Mossman, I was a GM, not directly after Bob, but I certainly worked with Bob. I think I was music director uh, when we worked together and then uh, became a general manager and pulled the FCC license. All it was was just a little license, like one card saying that we were approved to go on FM, pulled that out of the mailbox. And uh, with Eric's help, we didn't screw it up too badly. And certainly Bob helped with some early finance challenges that we had and uh, Got it all rocking and rolling, and it was a really, really exciting time to be a Z89. Now I am, uh, yes, I'm retired. I'm, I chose a horrible time to get into day trading, and my backup plan, the Powerball just apparently fell through. So <laughs> living life, actually my first date, Eric, I went up to the top of the Prue with my wife, whatever they called the, uh, rep, the bar up there. That was uh, the top of the hub when I was uh, growing up. It's all gone now. It's all torn up, and now it's called City View, and it's a beautiful uh, observatory, three floors, and um, it's really cool now. You have to come back and visit. Absolutely will. So I'm not sure where to start, but, I mean, we've talked about how in previous episodes the station uh, got started in 72, Dr. Wright came on in 75, and in the mid-'80s uh, the station ended up switching over to FM, and I'm not sure which one of you wants to lead off, but sort of take us back to then and how that all came together. Let me start with Bob. The quick version of it was a confluence of events. Right? We we're in 820 on University Avenue in this old house on the third floor with third and fourth hand equipment that Eric, bless his heart, kept patching together. Um, our antenna, in quotes, was a wires on top of Booth Hall that many of us on this thing and some others, I remember stringing up on the roof and I still got a scar on my hand from that. Wow. Um, okay. And then... <laughs> So during the summer of 82, I think I was station manager, John Englehart was GM, um, actually took down that antenna, again in quotes, and decided to peg WJPZ five grand. So when we got back to campus, John decided that was not the fight he wanted to take and I became general manager. So that was problem one is owing SU five grand. Problem two is we weren't broadcasting Ugh. except via the... Uh, TVs in the lobbies of dorms that you could get on UUTV. Carrier killing. And problem number three was SU was going to build a hotel, now the Sheridan, on Bay 21 University Avenue the following year, and they didn't plan on giving us a place to go. So we'll fast forward through a lot of stuff, but anyways, it all had a happy ending. Mark Humble is a huge part of this. And then Mark Ellenbogen from Student Government Association, who was fortuitous in his arrival there because prior to SGA could have given a hoot about WJPZ. Suddenly we resolved the issue with SU. We were able to get space in Watson 
Eric and Mark moved the station over that summer to Watson. We got back on Syracuse cable systems, which we had not been on in a few years. That was massive at the time for keeping the staff engaged. And then thanks to Mark Ellenbogen, a series of events started that led to the incorporation of WJPZ Radio Inc. Thanks to Eric working with Mark Humphreys, a frequency search that led to 89.1. You know, the end of my direct involvement was uh, helping with Eric and others to write an FCC application for what became WJPZ Radio. So hard to believe it all worked out the way it worked out, but it did, and we're still here. <laughs> Anybody want to jump in on there as far as picking up the story or adding any color to that? I can add the before story, the prequel, if you will. I just remember being there just for the love of radio itself and Top 40 in particular and doing the kind of radio that I wanted to get into. I remember there were times, Bob, where we were on 990 AM, probably illegally with Rick Wright's help, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but, you know, that was a big thing, being able to tell somebody I was on 990 or at least listen to the radio station myself at 990. And then there was a time when everything went away, where we weren't on AM and... We were just on carrier current. And like literally nobody could hear us. When you say carrier and, current, for those of our younger alumni, explain what you yeah, mean by that, yeah, Dr. Phil. Yeah. So if I'm correct, and Eric's the engineer here, but you had to plug the radio into the outlet to get the frequency that we were broadcasting. Is that right, Eric? No, but it was just oh. in the dorms. We had two very low power transmitters, one on Day Hall and one on, on oh. Booth. And... The signal was very weak because it was like 100 milliwatts. And I remember taking out ads in the Daily Orange and it said, if you can't pick us up, turn your radio. <laughs> They're actually ads that tell us to uh, turn the radio. But it was uh, quite difficult to pick up the station because of the 100 milliwatt uh, limitation. And yep. when we put the transmitter on Booth Hall, Bob was talking about that we kind of ran a long wire, which extended the range, which was probably not the greatest thing. And then <laughs> the reason the university took the uh, antennas down is because the roof started leaking. So they, uh, into the elevator machine room. So they were not happy. So that was part of the demise. So we all learned a lot. Details, but, details. But the, but the people were, were still coming in yes. oh, because yeah. we all love the mission and we wanted to make tapes to send out to get chopped. Sure. Overnight. The, overnight. You know, People would be there at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock yeah. in the morning. Yeah. 24 hours and a day. The, the knowing summer. that there would be nobody listening. And, you know, that really was the passion that had started from the beginning of the station and then kept it going and got it on FM and into what it's become today. Chris, what do you remember from those days? Um, we've been summing it up very well. You know, my time was a little bit later on. My freshman year was dorms and Syracuse cable. And then from that point, there became a whole lot of excitement in the air when everybody knew what was coming. My freshman year, there'd be a lot of turn, like the juniors and the seniors would often move on to other things. Right before we went FM, there was no churn. There were no shifts. You could probably have had death by combat to get a 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. show. <laughs> it was uh, it was that crazy, and the demand for people to get on the air was incredible. And that was still before we went FM. I think what Chris just said and what Phil said earlier, I mean, I think there were like 60, 70 people before Syracuse Cable Systems, and then Syracuse Cable Systems pre-FM was over 100. So, no, I did not do a jock shift my junior or senior year because I didn't want to take a slot from somebody else who needed it. I guess the other thing that comes to mind is by hook and crook. Many people like Phil and others work in the market. They work professionally for WHEN, WSYR, yeah. Phil eventually at Y94. That meant that things like, say, copies of records, those things you used your needle to play that produced music. <laughs> Again, for those younger listeners. Yeah. They are making a comeback, though, Bob. They are selling better than CDs in 2022. Yeah. Well, the point was we didn't have them. Yeah. And the ones we had, we acquired. And sometimes when we couldn't acquire a record, uh, someone carded it up, yeah. put it on a tape so we could play the tape, so we could play the hits that powered the station. So and We tried to beg the record company guys to get us on the mailing list at yeah. JTZ. 
And we ended up getting a fair amount of them. But a and I remember, a and wouldn't send us a damn thing. So we'd have to go to Record World or whatever it was in Marshall Square Mall to buy anything that Sting put out. <laughs> One other note for everybody under 50 who hears this. We used to slip cue the records because the turntables were a little slow to get uh, to get up and rolling. Does anybody under the age of 50 know what it means to slip cue? OK, I'm going to jump in here because uh, I, I am I'm 41. So um, that's sort of you, you fire it up a couple seconds before you need to actually be playing. Do I have that right? Uh, yeah, but you're holding on to the record. The, the turntable is spinning. You're hold, physically holding the record. And then when you say, you know, here's Sting on Z89, then you let take your finger off the record and it starts playing and the turntable's already up to speed. I love that. That paints such a great visual here, Chris. I'm so glad you brought that up. Talk to me, guys, about any lessons that you learned throughout this whole process or your time at the station that have served you well in your careers to this point. I'll throw in the word perseverance. And I'm going to give Bob a lot of credit for that. I remember my freshman year, there was a former GM, I'm pretty sure I have the name, but I'm not going to name him, (laughs) who told me it was impossible for Z89 to ever find a frequency. They'd done all these searches, done all this work, and there was no way it could ever be done. And I'm I'm sworn to secrecy knowing what I know. And I said, "I, I don't know. I think there's a reason to have some faith. And Bob and I know Eric had a big role in that. I don't know if Mark and Steve Simpson were involved in that point, but there was a whole lot of perseverance to make this thing happen. Thank you for that. I mean, being in Vermont, where sometimes you don't have the advantages you do in in more lucrative areas, even in whatever it is I do now, there's always a way. And probably has always been part of my character, but that was certainly, uh, JPZ is an example of that. There's always a way. And we can talk about WAER at some point here, but it's a little bit of revisionist history to say that JPZ happened because WAER was taken over by the university. That didn't happen exactly that way. And we were on our own for a long time. And it's the people on this screen and people like Mark Humble and Steve Simpson, and I'll keep bringing up Mark Ellenbogen, and sort of serendipity is, is why things ended up the way they did. Everything was rolling right along before WAER collapsed or whatever we want to say they did. We were on our path. We were pretty far down the path, but it made it a little bit easier as far as the, from one sense, it made it easier from the university perspective. But on the other hand, I would hear, well, you need to do block programming. You need to play Spanish music from six to nine and then have the new wave hour and follow that up by funk and then jazz. And AER had a lot of that musically, and that was not what we did. We were in our a training ground for radio. And at that point, you know, 100% toward the CHR format, period. End of story. The one thing that I think I gained most from uh, my time there was learning to deal with the bureaucracy of the university because it's very big. And the way I learned to deal with it was personal relationships because everybody that you mentioned, we made a personal relationship with those people, with the people at SGA. They were downstairs from us in the spectrum, and we went down and we met. Who was the secretary that was there who was so helpful? Oh. Anyway, making connections with all these people that helped us sell our case. Plus, for me, when it came time to, when we got the $100,000 from the university, from the student government, to actually spend the money, I had to deal with the bureaucracy university in purchasing. Hmm. So I made friends with the purchasing agent because everything needed three bids and then it was just building the project and then dealing with the planning people and the building inspectors and all that stuff was all stuff I use now every day in my job. So it was like a microcosm of what I do every day. Now I was able to learn at JPZ. So I use all those skills today. And But I think the personal relationship that we had with all these people. And then I want to go back a little bit about finding the frequency. Mark Humphrey, who was our uh, consulting engineer, he's the one that magically found that frequency in the middle of nowhere and shoehorned it in. We have to give him great kudos for that. Phil, anything stick out to you of uh, lessons learned from experiences? Yeah, I, two things are very vivid to me. One, I had in high school, uh, right before I started at Syracuse, I worked at a FM station in Poughkeepsie, which was top 40, did overnights on the weekends. And 
when I got to JPZ, you know, the goal was told to me, hey, this is, we run this like a real radio station. Yeah. This is like a commercial radio station. And I went in there and go, yeah, I mean, this is run at least as well, if not better than the commercial station I just left in Poughkeepsie. And then it helped me get the job at SYR as the program director at Y94. I mean, I had not been a program director or assistant program director, even at a commercial radio station. And Bob Neal, who was the operations guy at SYR at the time who hired me, you know, he had to justify me to the general manager. Bob said, you know, he was music director at the student radio station and the GM says, yeah, okay, so. And basically I said, look, there's nothing I can tell you that would prove this to you, but this station is run like a professional radio station. I know what I'm doing. And it helped me tremendously in just setting expectations, knowing what to expect and dealing with crazy shit that happened all the time. <laughs> all four of us went to JPZ and we chose JPZ. Even though it's on the third floor of this house, even though it had third and fourth hand equipment, because of Joe Pasternak, Steve Stiles, yep. people yep. that were there, at least when Phil, Eric, and I got there, and I know yep. Chris Yanuk, Joe, um, and we had the honor of inducting Joe into the JPZ Hall of Fame a few years ago. But, you know, there's that time between Mike Roberts and uh, Craig Fox and all the names we know in lineage. You know, Joe sort of gets forgotten, but they kept things going. They were selling advertising on Carrier yes. Current. And they had a professional radio station that appealed to us. Mitch Goldman actually gets credit for introducing me to JPZ, but that came across to us. And that's why we fell in love with it when we showed up there in 1980. And we were able to uh, give away six packs of old Vienna on the air. I don't, I rem I don't know who set, <laughs> I don't know who set up that deal, but that was like a huge deal when, when I got to do it, uh, Mike Richards. I remember the ad, I found the ad a year ago that we took out on the Daily Orange, you know, to win a six pack of old Vienna, listen to Phil and Mike on the, I mean, I, I don't know who set that up, but it was, it was awesome. That was the type of stuff that was really forward thinking at the time and then was as close as professional as you can get. You mean you were on a college campus, Phil, and you were giving away beer? What a great idea. I, uh, can you imagine? <laughs> what a, yeah, Another benefit what a of an 18 year old drinking age, huh? Right. Yeah. That's right. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. The good old days. That's right. I mean, I was drinking at 18, but I had a New York State ID that said my name was J.P. Kaminsky to make that happen when I was an undergrad at the time. Oh, cool. Hey, JP, I'm Eric Miller. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> we, go, we should do that with all these podcasts. Everybody go around and give the name that was on your fake ID. With the fake ID. Right, exactly. It's the podcast celebrating the world's greatest media classroom. It's WJPZ at 50. Hey, JPZers, it's Sam Kandel, class of 2018 and chair of this year's Banquet Committee. Banquet 38 will be March 4th, 2023. And you're going to want to be there to celebrate 50 years of hashtag radio. You can buy tickets now for $89, but only through December 15th. It's WJPZ at 50. Bob, you mentioned this a minute ago. Um, the story of getting onto FM, the short version that everybody tells for the sake of brevity, which may not be necessarily accurate, as you guys have all referenced, is that it coincided with AER being taken over by the station and becoming an NPR station. But there were so much more than that, and there was so much more that went into it. Give us the story from, as Chris Berman would say, I know because I was there. You guys can tell us exactly what happened because you had the front row seats. Yeah, I mean, and again, this could be the, you know, you had the album cut with Rick Wright. This could be the box set, but <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it relatively short. I mean, I can't emphasize enough that we were rebels. We were pirates. The only person who cared about us in Newhouse was Dr. Rick Wright. Mm -hmm. The only person. Yep. So when all heck broke loose and we were on the verge of losing our station, owing SU five grand, nobody was on our side except Dr. Rick Wright. And we were on our own. Dave W.A.E.R. sure as heck didn't care, even though the path to David Anderson was starting to get out of the gates. So that was happening slowly. I think the students there thought they could fight it off. Bob, let me stop you right there. David Anderson? Sorry, David Anderson became the professional at the university hired to administer WAER, okay. leading them on the path to become an NPR affiliate. Mm -hmm. Again, those things did not happen like this. We're talking a couple of years. So, you know, we were fighting for survival. Survival came first, and then the stars started aligning. As Eric said, Mark Humphreys and him, he had this crazy idea for a frequency search. Okay, cool. It was a non-commercial frequency, which is obviously what 89.1 is, 
I know there was at least with me a little bit of angst because JPZ was intended to be the full experience of a radio station, including radio sales um, and being self-sufficient. I also know we were super paranoid about maintaining our autonomy and how could we do that? In fact, the original JPZ bylaws had uh, our corporation, our Elizabethan corporation say that if JPZ went kaput, the assets would go to Spectrum Records because Spectrum at the time was a private nonprofit that had a record store, travel agency, and some other stuff. Huh. I'm dancing around the story, but I think it was it was a case of we got on cable, Syracuse Cable Systems. We knew we had a home the following year. We we're going to get kicked off campus. And then the frequency search happened, and there was a frequency. And that all coincided with Mark Ellenbogen becoming initially the controller of the Student Government Association, and then ultimately the president. Mark, by the way, lives in Prague. I'm still in touch with him, and he runs a, an interesting NGO that's involved with diplomacy. Wow. I guess the other piece of the FM story I'll share is our bylaws, or the original set of bylaws anyways, got ripped off from WFRD at Dartmouth College. Hmm. Dartmouth College still owns the radio station, but it was somewhat autonomous. So I was working back home here with people and students from WFRD and got my hands on that. So we cribbed from that. We worked with the Syracuse attorney, Jeff Davis, to incorporate the station and all these things to try and preserve its autonomy and obviously secure funding once we had the frequency search, you know, to head towards FM. And that path, and Chris actually probably should speak to this, Mark Humble's not on here, but those two guys particularly, it wasn't as simple as I filed the application and boom, we were FM. Oh. It was year and change and a lot of things happened in between. They actually dug into the bylaws very, very closely at the FCC when they were going through everything. The one issue that they had with us was that there was no solution for carrying forward, no succession plan with the students owning it, because we were truly the first student-owned and operated radio station to get an FM license. They'd never seen anything like a group of students looking for an FM license. So again, the solution to our problem, Dr. Rick Wright. I got with Rick and he agreed to be the succession plan should anything happen with the students that Rick will always be there, will always be part of Syracuse University and the program. And he put it on his back and that got us a lot closer to the finish line. Again, until that day, Another summer day going down to the mailbox to hopefully find a couple of records from a company other than A&M. And boom, there it was. Which summer was that, Chris? Summer of 84. And then I quickly got so excited I could barely ride my bicycle to get from there back to Watson. And then got on the phone and called everybody who had a, had a role in this. We got it! We got it! We got it! Then uh, it was a big day. Very, very very exciting. And you were talking about the frequency thing and finding the whole, another fun one that I had back in the day was, uh, I think it was Bob and Mark probably sending me up to Central Square, uh, WCSQ there. And I had to go through their public file and find all kinds of information out of the CSQ public file, but I wasn't allowed to tell them anything. Sort of what it's like to be an undercover spy, but not a very good one. Another transferable skill. They had the 89.1 frequency prior. Do I, is that right? 89.3 was there. So okay. Central Square is what, roughly 25 miles north of Syracuse? Mm -hmm. And they were still on the air? I mean... They were still on the air. It was a... Oh, wow. Uh, okay. I believe it was a high school operation. But again, with our initial frequency, how many watts were we? We're 100. Well, yeah. We weren't supposed to get up that far. But I remember the night before the official sign-on when we were doing the test... We sent a couple of cars out, and one of them went north. <laughs> I believe it was Mark and Rob Weingarten going north, and somebody else went south. And north, they went 30, 35 miles north, and then just ended up turning around because they just got tired of driving. The signal was still coming in great going up north. Going south, they got you know about 10 miles down toward Tully, and there was nothing. But I don't think we were projecting that we were going to go quite as far north as we did. And then the early bitching, uh, Fitch, you probably remember this. I think it was the neighborhood right behind the hill. They were all bitching about the Oswego NPR station. Yeah. And apparently, the transmitter was causing some interference with them. Well, there was one professor who liked to listen, who made a big stink 
and uh, it was a thorn for a long time. I'm going to actually mention that. I think you're thinking of uh, WRVO, if I remember right, in Oswego. Because, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So this is where we come full circle, because what's what's wild about this conversation for me personally is you guys were there for the start and moving into Watson. I was there for the end of Watson. So I was there when... We uh, had to leave Watson for the renovation and go into this house on Ostrom, which you could probably compare apples to apples of how shoddy it was a system was jury rigged and set up to when you guys were in the original location. Couldn't have been that bad. Couldn't have been. We should do like a side by side comparison. The 40 year elders on that, John. Fair enough. <laughs> you, four of you and one of me, and we appreciate you right. coming on. So fair enough. You uh-huh. had it worse than we did, but we did have a, a difficult setup there <laughs> as we moved out of Watson. But in that same time period, and this is late 90s, early 2000s, I'll say his name. I don't care. He's dead. Dr. John Oldfield was a thorn in our side. He would uh, make complaints to the FCC all the time because we were interfering at 89.1 with, I'm trying to remember what uh, this frequency was for RVO, but uh, 89.9 is what RBO's frequency is right now out of Oswego. They would always complain, and we're like, just like you guys, we're 19, 20-year-old kids going, what are we supposed to do with this? He was just vocal. Yeah. He, he didn't have a leg to stand on, but he was just vocal. He was Karen before there were Karens. <laughs> yeah. It was blanketing interference. It was just he was close to the tower, and so his radio was getting overloaded. And then the FCC's mailbox got overloaded as a result. Got it. All right. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to have the four of you on. And, you know, there were many, many others that you mentioned uh, along with you that helped get the station on FM and shepherd us through that very difficult times over the 50 now year history of the station. There are so many instances where it was almost like we were hanging by a thread, but a number of folks, present company included, stepped up to keep the thing going that had started back, you know, in the early 70s and is still going now into the 2020s. We have six decades of alums, thanks to folks like you who have helped keep the station going. I'm curious for your perspective of what you've seen on the radio station since you left. I'm curious what you've seen in the time since you've uh, been alums and, and what you've seen the station do in the time that you've been out. I'll lead on that one. Well, it's a different world. The radio industry is very, very different. When we were all in school, there were, what, probably 13 independent radio stations, 14 or 15 in Syracuse with 14 or 15 program directors, 14 or 15 general managers. And now the world is what I heard, Odyssey, Beasley, and maybe a couple other groups. I was in Syracuse the weekend after Labor Day listen to Z89 a little more than I normally would listen to that type of music in this day and age as an old fart. And uh, I don't think I heard a live personality on the air the whole time. And I was listening for hours, just a different, different world. It does raise the question though. And I I can echo that. I was out to ask you for some football games. I I did finally hear a live break a couple weeks ago on a Friday. And obviously now we could all listen to it anytime anyways, because we can stream. But how does what we knew and know is WJPZ adapt and still serve as a laboratory to teach communicators and broadcasters. Because I think, and I'm not in the business you three are, but I still think being a broadcaster carries some usefulness in the world, regardless of what the medium is, just as our friend John is showing in the world of podcasting. It's just a delivery service, whether it's amplitude modulation or frequency modulation or podcast or streaming or goodness knows things we don't even have thought of yet. Yeah. You still can effectively entertain and inform people. And you learn that at WJPZ. Phil, Eric, anything you've seen as you've been watching the station and you've uh, enjoyed seeing? I think it's all content. I think that's the primary thing that we were training people to be content providers. And I mean, look, you've developed it to doing this great podcast and those skills carry on. I mean, I go back to, uh, do you remember Don Beveridge, Phil? Oh, yeah. So he had a, a story where he talked about the uh, railroads. And he said, the problem with the railroads and why they all failed is they thought they were in the railroad business, but they were in the transportation business. Ah. And that's why they failed. And so we're in the communications business. And so whatever skill we learn and we have, we just have to carry it on. And, and the tool we use, it's going to change. So I think that's the important thing that we have. And we have video. They have video on the, uh, in the morning show. And um, it just changes. It's nice to see when I go back to the banquets, still the people that have the passion for it and still love to be, quote unquote, on the air or even doing podcasts or some sort of audio content. 
mm-hmm. and get into, as Rick Wright would say, show business, because that's what it is. It's great to see the younger and younger generations getting into that, because if you listen to everybody else, radio is dead and it's gone, but it's not. And I face that all the time with, oh yeah, I mean, who radio is like newspapers. Who listens? At least with newspapers, we have the data that shows that nobody's reading them. <laughs> with, <laughs> with radio, we, it's the opposite. Uh, you still have to fight that perception. It's nice to see that the real world of people that want to get into it are still into it. At least that's what I see when I go in there. Absolutely. Guys, are there any uh, funny off-the-wall stories that pop to mind from your time with the station? I mean, obviously, there were a ton of craziness among all the things that you've accomplished with the radio station and getting it on FM and fighting the good fight and, you know, ragtag bunch of guys, as you guys kind of self-described yourselves. Tell me about any funny behind-the-scenes moments that come to mind. Spectrum building. Before we moved to Watson, next door, you were talking about the turntables and the printing press for Spectrum Printing was in the room next to us. And whenever I ran the printing press, the cart machines would wow. So you'd hear it on the air. You go, whoa, whoa. So we were smart and we were in an extension cord out the window, downstairs, and plugged into the outlet in Mark Ellenbogen's office. And that worked <laughs> great. So the whole radio station was running fine. And then one day I got a phone call. The radio station's off the air because the cleaning lady had come and unplugged <laughs> the radio station to plug in the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> What was your one uh, that you remembered, Phil, that I said about Boston, five guys from Boston who were not five guys from Boston or something? Oh, yeah. You used to intro the records as uh, the cars, five gentlemen from Boston and three. And then there was the cars. And then you introduced the Boston guys the same way. It was three gentlemen from Boston. (laughs) These are rock and roll guys. They're not gentlemen. And I think you and I were fooling around on the air as the Rock Brothers. Yes. Dr. Bob and Dr. Phil Rock. And I think that's where you first got Dr. Phil. Well, that's exactly where it started. That's exactly right. I do remember that. The story that I have has nothing to do with JPZ, but I remember uh, it's got everything to do with Rick Wright. Okay. So Rick, I was in his class and he took us on a field trip to WOLF radio, which uh, he was chief engineer at the same time. So we went into WOLF. He gave us a tour of the facilities and then we got to the uh you know the room with the equipment in it so he's showing the transmitter to everybody and he says see now wolf operates during the day at a thousand watts and at night it goes down to 250 watts that's you know the license the fcc gave it and this was like 12 noon he says so you know when the sun goes down the dj comes over and he flips the switch and rick proceeds to flip the switch at 12 (laughs) noon to go from a thousand to 250 and you see, you know, the, the, the meters go, you know, all the way down. And he changed the signal right in the middle of the day to a nighttime <laughs> signal. And I said, Rick, did you really switch the signal here? Is that, are we 250? I mean, should you have done that? He says, that, don't worry, nobody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> and that was half what went WLF with like country or whatever. <laughs> I thought that was hysterical. Anyway, that's, that's one of my favorite Rick Wright stories. All right. So while we've got, the three of you who are, you know, got a couple extra years, the padlock. Did we ever see the padlock? Do we know how big the padlock is? That predates us, I think, right? Or, yeah, yeah, I, I think it predates, yeah. That was mid to late 70s, if, if my history is right. And I mean, at least we named a scholarship after it, so we have that. Love it. Got it. Love it. Just, just wondering if there's any way, to, any way to back up just how big it really was. I think it's one of those things where as the years go on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We're almost 50 years since the padlock at this point. Well, it's a government padlock, right? So, of course, it's, you know, it has some, some heft to it. Yeah. Huge. Nobody's got the key. Yeah. Big. <laughs> some of the stories you tell, um, and, and I talked to Scott McFarlane about this because he did the documentary on the 40th anniversary of JPZ 10 years ago. And I asked him what his big takeaway from the documentary was. And he said that, uh, to your point, Phil and Eric, about the students working there, the students that he talked to from the 70s and the 80s for this documentary, and the students he talked to from the 2000s, they were the same student. The technology was a diff- little different. The ages were a little bit different. The world was a little bit different. But it was the same person. It was the same person that worked at JPZ that has kind of carried on 50 years later. And I think you guys have kind of illustrated that here, that we have so much in common just across the years of so many of us with this thing. And I, and I have to say, when we were putting this episode together, Bob connected me with the rest of you and kind of got this thing going where 
what's cool is these relationships that have been built. It feels like the four of you are all in contact and they're just kind of comfortable with each other, that it was very easy to get you all in the same room here virtually and have a conversation. And that speaks to the relationships built at the radio station. Agreed. A name we've mentioned once or twice, but really we need to get back in the family of Steve Simpson, the yeah. radio in the Midwest. And we all are in touch with Mark Humble, who's still in New York. But Steve was a really important part of this and really deserves to be remembered. I guess my other comment is, for me, WJPZ was not just about the rock stars who are going to go on to fame and fortune like Scotty McFarlane and others. And that's great. But it was also about people who might never do radio for the rest of their lives, but they were yeah. treated as equals and peers just as well as the high flyers. So the studio in Watson was actually dedicated at the time to a student who was killed in a horrible accident in that elevator at Day Hall, uh, Matt Wasser. There is a plaque to this day in WJPZ. And when I go, and when I go this coming March, that's the first thing I look for to make sure that's still there. And I tell whoever's there, what I just shared here, to remember, first of all, don't ever mess with that plaque. And secondly, WJPZ is about everybody who's there and is part of the experience, not just who goes on to be a famous TV or communications or radio star or whatever. And that's, I think, one of the elements that always made WJPZ special and unique say from WAER. It really was about everybody. Great. Yeah, with with Matt, I think it happened early in January. It happened in the winter. A little bit before we went on the air, and it was a major news story in Syracuse. I mean, I think it was probably the lead story for a couple of days, and all of the TV stations were coming by, and they'd start asking questions about what we're doing. It's like, sorry, I'm not going there. We lost one of our own here, and this hurts us really, really badly. Just a tragic accident. I didn't know that story, which is why I'm glad I have so many different folks on this podcast, because I don't want any of these stories to be lost to time. I'm, what an awful story, but I'm really glad that you guys are all here to share it, to let the folks listening to the podcast know about the story. Yeah. As we wrap up, any closing thoughts here, gentlemen? These were exciting times, and I'm honored that I got to work with many, many great people who are very passionate about the radio industry, passionate about the business and wanting to put the best product on the air we possibly could, even though there were 25 people listening to us in a good quarter hour. Thank you for doing this, John. Yeah, John, great idea. Thank you. Uh, and it's funny how all these ties that bind, um, Bob and I have bonded over my time in Vermont. Chris, it's great to get to know you here. Dr. Phil, when I was briefly running a mentorship program, that's when I first connected with you to right. figure out what the heck I was doing, and you were a great resource to me then. Eric, you and I connected when you came back for your Hall of Fame, and also through our mutual friend, Andrew Kaiser, who I know worked with you in Boston. I worked with him up in Vermont. It's really cool to see how all these ties that bind all of us throughout all the years. And you know, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank the four of you for your role, both as students and as alumni, and for coming on to share some great stories today. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John, for putting it all together. The WJPZ at 50 podcast is created entirely by the staff and alumni of the world's greatest media classroom. It's hosted by John Jag Gay, class of 2002. Editing help from James Bames Grundy III, class of 2020. Imaging by Maureen Cooper, class of 1999. And Ed Lacombe, class of 1985. Podcast artwork by Marty Dundix, class of 2001. Follow WJPZ at 50 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.